guys that are on the screen here. Welcome to uh, the Museum of Music that's going to be uh, welcome to Tessa and Rosie Bowe. My name is Nico Lato, I'll be hosting uh, this tonight. And um, we'd like to give you a warm welcome to uh, Tessa. I presume that uh, many of you have already been here uh, here before. So you kind of probably expect us to move you around through the space uh, tonight and visit all these demo sites that we have. Um, and I'd like to go through the program with you uh, before that so you know where, uh, what is going to happen. And uh, while I do so, please enjoy the uh, novel targets or the, the little snacks that you got in the door. Who hasn't received one of them yet? Okay, please, um, yours? Can you get some novel targets you? <laughs> to get your taste buds going for the uh, these, uh, these little bags of snacks that were made by Lisa Carlos Brown, especially in design for this uh, test lab. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, okay, we'll, uh, sh shortly after this, we're going to uh, ask Arjen Hill to the stage, who is, uh, will open this evening in terms of laying down the fundament for, uh, for the English theme. And Arjen um, is, is a familiar name here. Uh, 
uh, a device called um, the electric torch, which is a sensory substitution device. So it translates spatial information of the environment into tactile information. And of course, you get a chance to actually uh, use this device in, in the space uh, tonight. Um, not only will Tom demonstrate the device, but we'll also really touch upon the impact that this uh, device has had on the uh, science community. It has a wide theoretical impact on uh, theories of consciousness and cognition. And uh, besides demonstrating the tool, uh, which is actually meant as a blind thing, we will also touch upon the, the theoretical uh, implications of the device. Then finally, at the end of the program, uh, we'll have a long here of artists, friends, and artists who are friends and thesis. And they will present a completely uh, different kind of Tonight we're just talking about being and the relationship. Now, about the perception, that's a whole idea of how we can do it in the understanding of media theory. I said that the peculiar thing of the system of media theory is that it intensifies one sense of extensive. Well, if you have a talk about what film, I 
Why? Because you're totally involved in one sense of vision, and the rest of your senses are not controllable. Think about narcissism as Margot. You see a kind of image of the world, of human beings, etc. that you've never seen before. And you're so fascinated that all the rest of your senses are fine. Under the Margot, it's he talks about uh, 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 an amputation of your all senses. So you hold in mono media and you say, how do you do it? an amputation of all senses that are not present. This, there is some sort of uh, family behind this idea of entrepreneurship. And the idea is that once there goes a very heavy time, the life of humanity. So the old age was the old age era, where people experience the real world, the previous, the older sense, in an ideal combination, an ideal sensation, a combination of the sense. He calls it a two-six space. A two-six space because without hearing, you hear space in 3D and not in a in that field as in a speaking. And in this uh,
As you can see, I did two or three four months in Greece. After a while, I skipped to the two months, but not very And it's not that easy to do it that way, because it was very hard as a telephone thing. And there's a television there, for example. Anyway, after two months, you start to realize why we need that dust. Right? Because you start to eat it. Right? They're all there still. But you don't know because you don't need them anymore because they're all the media and it's on. It's pretty scary sometimes, but then. I guess. For the most interesting thing I had, I was reading last year an old epic called The Argonauts, where all the old sailors are sitting on the platform, and then suddenly you look at it. The God of all is moving about. How do you know? Because there is an incredible science. This was something I really recognized in my journey So I am not know if it's very Anyway, this is a back to nature approach of, you know, the connection to the media system. If you skip the media, you'll get all the information sets and use that in the system. So now we're on a different track, right? We're not progressing. We're going forward to the moment. This is a this is an approach which I find very good. Because one thing, as I said, in our time we have the dominant feature of most division and here.
uh, they can press a button on their remote and they get captioned. So words to the text of, of what's being spoken goes on the screen. So similarly, there's a service in Canada, I'm not sure if you guys have it here, um, called Video Description. So that, uh, it's a parallel. So Video Description is for the blind. And instead of turning audio into text, we're turning vision into audio. So for example, if there was a fight scene in a movie, uh, someone, a narrator would come and narrate that, that fight scene so that the person who's blind is able to follow the plot of the story and, and enjoy the movie just as much. So basically what I've done, is uh, I've created a, a software package that uh, allows just anyone, any one of you can go to our website, uh, impc.ca slash livedescribe, and you can download this software. It's for Windows, unfortunately, only right now. Um, but what you can do is import a video, and you can add your own description. You can make descriptions. Currently, in Canada, there is a service, um, like a professional service, but unfortunately, it, it doesn't provide enough content, in my opinion. So what I'm hoping is, with this software here, uh, which basically just works like a, a fancy uh, you know, video recorder and audio recorder, you can create this description and upload it to a wiki that's currently in development right now. So if you go to imc.ca slash livedescribe slash wiki, uh, which is currently in development, you could upload your created descriptions and then a blind person can come visit that and, and see them. So the special thing about this software is what it does is it goes through the audio um, and it tries to find portions of, of the audio where there are no dialogue. Because it's unlike captioning where you can just throw up the words pretty much as they occur. In description, you have to wait until there's someone, there's a, a period of non-dialogue because you don't want to talk over someone else's dialogue. So I'll show you, the, the screen at the bottom there is, is a timeline representation of the audio in that, in that program. So what you see here, uh, these are spaces. So if I play it right from this. Well, just imagine. But basically, uh, what you can do, there's a list of all the spaces. You can go through that and you can find the spaces and, and add the description. So I don't have much time, so I'll move on from that. That's one of our projects. Another interesting project we have is called uh, Sign Language Studio. So this project um, essentially puts sign language on the internet. Although, well, I, I shouldn't say on. I should probably say of the internet because. You know, with YouTube or whatever, you can have sign language in video, but the interesting part about this is that you can link signs in these videos, right? So you can go to a sign language page as a deaf person and see a web page in your native language, right? Which is ASL in this case. So um, as the video would, be, would play, if someone signs the word, let's say, cat, and they would like to link that word to a website about cats, well then, you can use our software that we've created to go through the video and you can create a signed link, right? So the video will highlight and say, oh, there's a link here, and so the deaf person can go and follow that sign link to another page. So those are kind of just two quick examples of uh, the other projects that we're doing, cross modality and things like that. So now I'll kind of uh, mosey on to the chair. So we'll just bring this up. Um, so Graham will talk more about the specific parts, the design of the chair, how it's made up. But over in, at Ryerson, we're doing uh, a lot of research kind of that backs, up, backs us up. And basically, this is going to be an apparatus for us where we can test, you know, we can spend years and years testing various things like that. But I'll just talk about uh, a couple of quick, a uh, couple of experiments that we did just quickly. So the first one we did was we wanted to uh, determine the emotional, the, the, the ability of tactile vibrations to convey emotion. So simply what we did is we attached 12 or eight speakers to the back of our subjects, and we play music. Um, now we can cut off their hearing by putting in earplugs and white noise. If you get a chance to try the chair, you'll, you'll find out what that is like. So that essentially makes them deaf, they can't hear anything. And then we played happy music, and we played sad music, which has been determined through other research to be happy and sad. And what we found was that, yes indeed, just playing straight music through vibrations on speakers to the back does convey emotion. Um, another experiment we're working on is trying to discover the um, so-called notes of a tactile scale. So um, basically what happens is you, your skin is like a really um, insensitive ear uh, and your range is much smaller, probably between 20 hertz to about 1,000 hertz. So what we want to do is take the scale of music and kind of squish it down and move it into the scale, the range of tactile, uh, tactile notes. So we've done some studies and we found that there are uh, worst case scenario, some people are really sensitive, some people are insensitive, but worst case scenario, we found about 50 or so 
notes that a, that a person can distinguish in the tactile domain. So that's kind of the research that we're doing that kind of goes behind this chair. And I, I think my 10 or so minutes is coming out. I'll hand it off to Grant, and he's going to talk a little bit more about the actual chair. And uh, hopefully, a lot of you will get to try it out later tonight. So, Grant? Yeah, thanks, Carl. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, you're all uh, uh, actually test subjects because uh, the actual chair will be shipped back to Canada for research purposes after this demonstration. So you are a, a select group of, well, I think, are there any hearing? I guess they would be able to hear me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was brought in as, a, as kind of an artist in residence on this project. Uh, a lot of my work involves uh, working with universities in research projects. Um, some of them that I've, I've done in the past. Uh, I've worked a lot with universities, and um, actually, the talking about McLuhan is, is relevant because uh, I was a, a head researcher at the McLuhan program in culture and technology at the University of Toronto, running a, a virtual reality artist access program back in the in the 1990s, and. Part of that research showed that uh, people, kids who are sick, have a really hard time uh, going back to school, is that they become uh, disconnected with their, their social and learning environments. And part of the, the video conferencing artworks I was doing uh, became this product, which is the Pebbles, the, the video conferencing robot, um, which is a collaboration between Ryerson University, uh, myself, and my company, Telbotics and the University of Toronto. Um, and actually, you're going to be able to see another one of these. This is, I hate Windows machines. This is the, uh, the web chair. And it's uh, my latest uh, and greatest invention. And we just uh, struck a deal with KPN, where they're going to put 30 of these in to help, again, sick kids link from their schools back to their learning environments. And it's got a Mac Mini inside, and a screen that rotates, and um, it links on Skype video back to the, to the kids in, who are sick. Um, this is the, uh, the group of, of students I work with at uh, Hakkaiyu, the Utrecht School of the Arts in Industrial Design and Robotics. And we took this idea that, that uh, Ryerson had been working on. And the idea is that when, when people are, are hard of hearing, are deaf, and they see a video, you know, in, in an Alfred Hitchcock film, you know, when the murderer is coming up behind the person and the music is kind of going, you know, we have this emotional impact because we can hear, we, we understand that. The person who's hard of hearing watching this, they're, they're seeing a, a, a thing on the bottom of the screen saying, very scary music, you know, and they're going, oh, great, you know, scary, yeah. So you'll, you'll see, we, we've, we've, what we've decided is, you know, McLuhan saw video as a very cold medium, and, and film is very hot, and the reason he said that was that in film, you're getting an incredible amount of, of information. Uh, video scans, very low resolution, so your brain has to work to actually build up an image. Whereas film is a very rich, rich medium. It's lots of visual information. So what we're trying to do is turn video into a, from a cold to a hot medium. And, and how do we do that? Well, let's, uh, let's go back to this stool here. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. You know, the, the, the stool itself, the chair, and actually, the, the, the real name for this thing is the Assisted Sensory Information Display. And I don't know if it was a little bit of a joke they had, so it's the ACID project. Developed in the Netherlands, though, okay, well. Um, so what we did is, what we decided to do was combine a whole series of senses. So when there's a scary moment in a film, you get cold air at the back of your neck. When you see the, the monsters come in the, in the movie, your, your whole chair is on a motion platform. When the fire scene comes up, you smell the smoke and you feel the heat. Uh, 
we're, we're also including uh, colored lights so that the, the screen will light up into different colors. When it's cold, it'll be very blue. When it's hot, it'll be very red. And you also have speakers all over your body, so you're feeling the sound from this device. And, you know, you have to experience it and understand it. And so some of you will get a chance to do that. And I just want to show you something here that, you know, I, I've been making crazy technology for, for most of my life, from, from virtual reality to telepresence to robots to God knows what. And when I saw this video, it, it actually really freaked me out. And it takes a lot to freak me out. And it, it, I think this says it all, actually. So we'll try playing this. At first glance, Roger Bain looks like an independent guy who loves his power tools. And he is. But here's what he's actually seen since he was a young man. But part of his world is slowly coming back into focus through experimental technology called BrainPort. One day it could actually help blind people see, in a sense, using their tongues. Yes, their tongues. It swaps tiny cameras for eyes and transforms the images into electrical impulses that are felt on the tongue. It's as if it's drawing on the tongue the still image. And so if you capture the images fast enough, paint them fast enough, it's like a video display. Instead of being on a screen, now it's on your tongue. You know, when you're a kid, I don't know if you did or not, but when you're a kid, kids would draw on your back and try to guess what it is. In normal vision, the eyes send signals to the middle of the brain. From there, the signals are sent directly to the visual cortex at the back of the brain. Not so for the blind. The brain port retrains the way the brain processes information by first stimulating the tongue with an array of tiny electrodes. The nerves in the tongue send signals through a different pathway to the brain stem and the area that deals with touch. Eventually, the blind person learns to interpret touch as sight in the visual cortex. Sounds impossible? Well, watch how Roger walks through the brain port office without any guidance. He can navigate this obstacle course, picking out specific shapes. Excellent. The camera sees this image, Roger feels it on his tongue, and that's how he can even spot the logo on a football jersey. Very good. Other blind volunteers recognize numbers. Nine. It's like learning a language. At first, you might need to spend a lot of time thinking about what the translation is. I may feel stimulation in the right front part of my tongue. What does that mean? But very rapidly, like learning a language, you might learn a few uh, quick vocabulary, and eventually you become so fluent that you don't need to think about it anymore. Blindfolded, I try it myself. After a humbling first attempt... I want to say it's diagonal. Okay. And this one is vertical. I managed to understand some of the brain port language. I want to say it goes this way. You are correct. Okay. The technology is improving. Today, a car looks like this to a brain port user. A few months from now, they hope it will look like this. And in a year and a half, more like this. For the blind, there are a glimpse at more freedom. This develops where the next generation can really get benefits from it. Even if I don't get the greatest out of it, I am still can determine if I can see their eyes and maybe even see a smile or a grin, you know, that kind of stuff. It can be cool. And for the rest of us, it's a miraculous look at how our brains can be trained to rewire themselves. Daniel Seberg, CBS News, Madison, Wisconsin. Now, Carmen's is going to set up the, the display um, so we can have a little uh, a test and see what it's like. Um, but I found that video specifically interesting because, I mean, who would have ever thought that you could see through your tongue? I mean, that to me is, is such a bizarre concept. Um, and and it, it goes back to, to a friend of mine who, who became uh, blind. And she developed a, a, a very large part of her eyeball which cracked. And she developed a big, huge black spot on her eye. So she couldn't see this whole area here. It was just impossible. And yet, she didn't notice it. When she looked around, she saw exactly what you see. Because her brain would fill in what it thought should be there. And it wasn't until you, you took a piece of paper and wrote a number on it and hid it from her and then put it in that spot that she could see that you were holding up a piece of paper. 
She could see you, and even though you, she couldn't really see you, her brain filled that in, but she couldn't tell what the number was. And that to me is, is such an amazing thing. It shows us that, that we're only seeing a tiny portion of what is out there, of what we could see. Is that our, our brains fill in stuff that we haven't got a clue what it's filling in. Um, so, I don't know if, uh, Carmen, you tell us when you're ready over there? We don't want to stress you out too much. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Has anyone got any questions about the project or the emotion chair? Does anyone want to try? Any volunteers? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. It's only five euros, don't worry. Goes for a good time. Just joking. Just joking. Um, Okay. Yeah, and, and I mean, I got to apologize because, in, in some ways, because uh, some of my students who already have their mark and promised they would have the video for this finished, well, I don't see them here today. Um, so we're using other material work, commercial stuff um, that we pulled off the net just to demonstrate it. Um, and the, the emotion chair, it, you'll find that, that the one sense that we're really having a hard time, and I really want to see the thing on smell tonight, is, is smell. It's such a difficult thing to, to generate uh, a, a various ranges of smells. And once you do in, include numerous smells, it's sort of like, it becomes like a smog. And it, you don't smell anything very quickly. So we, we tried using fans to, to take the, the smell out of the environment. And we used this thing called a scent dome. But basically, it just smelled like perfume to me. So. Um, you know, I think ultimately, from a practical point of view, we we will not uh, we will not include the uh, the smell ultimately in the uh, in the final device because there's just no practical way. I mean, if you want to create sound, that's easy. If you want to create color, that's easy. Vibration, air, these things are incredibly simple to do with the technology we have, and yet smell is is probably the most primitive and most basic kind of sensory input, but it's the most difficult to control from a, a media perspective. And maybe ultimately there's some way to, uh, to stimulate that, just as they did with the tongue, you know, on the brain. Maybe if I have a speaker on my, you know, a certain part of my body that I'll smell things. Who knows where the, uh, the uh, it's all gonna go. But I think we're already ready over there yet? Uh, yeah, I think if, by the time our participant gets plugged in, we'll be ready to go. Okay. Yeah, I guess we have to find a uh, willing fit. Any volunteers? Okay, now what we're going to do is, now what we're going to do though, is we're going to cut the person off from, from the, the sound inputs, because you're supposed to be deaf. So we're going to give you earplugs, and I believe they're right out of the box. So. We're also going to play white noise through a pair of headsets. So when you're seeing the film, you're going to have earplugs in, and you're going to hear white noise. So basically, you're going to be cut off from your, your, your sound environment. OK, here you go. Oh, watch out. Now these, these speakers, you put your hands on there, that's right. So they, they, we found that the, this part of your arm is very sensitive to sound. Yeah, that'd be better. You're all hanging up for it. Or at least you can't hear me. Okay. Okay. Um, so, are we ready to... One minute. Okay. You're not hearing any white noise? Oh. oh. As you can see, there's tons of wires. And like I say, this device will be shipped back tomorrow. And it will be used for a series of experiments over the next couple of years with people who are deaf to, to gain an insight into how they, they, uh, they can feel. So we have 
we will eventually have colored lights around here that we can, we can change. Um, we've got the lights in here, but we haven't got the, the, the controller. You can see these are just changing uh, randomly right now. But they will be able to, to be computer controlled back in Toronto. Uh, this is a very uh, complex device. Well, it's a blow dryer, okay. But it does very easily simulate heat. Now, the, these are the, these are, we call these Medusa's uh, the hairdo kind of. And believe it or not, this is a machine tool for, uh, for machining equipment where they bring in cutting fluid into high-speed uh, devices to cool the, the metal that they're machining. We've kind of used it in a different kind of way. So this one will be for the very scary back of the neck sensation. And the, the reason we divide, designed it like this is we wanted to make it so the person himself or herself could, could put the, the device where they wanted. Because it is kind of uh, shocking, as you'll find, that, that people have their own specific place that they like to, to have air blown to different <laughs> parts of their body. I kind of like it myself. It gives it a kind of a David Cronenberg, another great Canadian, by the way. Um, okay, I think we're, we're rolling. And then the first clip we're using is, well, okay, it's cheesy, I know, but you gotta come over here, is Jurassic Park. Okay, well. So, um, I don't know, you're gonna have to come over this side to see it. Either that or we can have someone with a video camera look at the screen and then project it up there. But.
how's our test subject doing? You still alive? Yeah. Tell us what, what I was like. All these troubles are such a bad move. <laughs> what happens if you look at well, that's what, we're looking at. that's what we're looking at. I mean, you know, we, we really want to work with filmmakers to see what happens when, how you can combine these kinds of inputs into really incredible artistic experiences. Um, the arms are interesting, I feel. Yeah. yeah, you really do get a real, you really do feel part of the movie through the sound of the arms. That's what I felt. You really, even though you can't hear it, you, you, you get a sense of it. Yeah, and you get scared of shit out of you if you're sitting thinking your name. And then, and the, the very last demo tonight, we'll, we'll do the smell demo, but it's, it's the, it's the, uh, it's from background, so it's, you might think the place is burning down, but it's not. I have more questions for Carmen Graham or even I. Uh, is this, is, you, you put all the FX in with this one movie, right? There's no translation of the uh, software. Well, no, not, not automatic. I mean, what we've done is, there, we, we have a max patch so that if it's a, like a, a com on the computer, we can we can control different things through the computer to do it different times. Right now, we're just doing it manually. Um, but back in Toronto, to be able to, to to run a max patch program that just runs the whole thing automatically. Well, what then does it does it translate the, the sound into movement or? Um, no, we're we're trying to find out what our, the experiment is. What which what works? I mean. You know, the, 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 the back of your head it definitely is, is weird, scary shit. You know, you, you do pick up stuff on your arms. The sound of the movie somehow translates even though you can't hear it. Um, so the, the, the idea is to experiment, to see what are, I mean, it's an experiment, so we don't know what the results are going to be. Okay. But we'll come back to you in a year and tell you. <laughs> okay, um, Maybe it's best if we move back to, uh, to that side of the, of the space. And um, see the presentation by Cecil Close of Tiba and Oh, it's over here. Sure. Okay, um, my name is uh, Sietzke, Sietzke Klooster, and uh, V2 invited me to tell a bit about uh, the Touch Me There installation. Now the thing is, I'm not the designer of the Touch Me There installation. Uh, I initiated and coached the project, but it's actually a student's project, and therefore I, I would like to give the word later on to uh, Rob Tiebe and Koen van Boerdonk, who really designed this installation. Um, okay, so what will I tell? I will tell a bit about the background of the project, and um, then Rob and Koen will present more about the content and look at the project from a multimodal perspective. Um, okay, the background. This project uh, started um, uh, based on a project that I um, initiated for, uh, as a teaching project. 
Um, I teach in Eindhoven based on my own design approach, which I call choreography of, in choreography of interaction. I always fall over the words myself, but anyway. <laughs> um, uh, I teach this um, way of working uh, through projects, and uh, in 2006, two years ago, I um, asked students to design um, a meeting duet. And what I asked them is um, to design a meeting activity on the Lowlands Festival. That was the first step to do, and that's also what I do in my way of working. I first design activities. Um, and I then asked them to design a, a product that uh, elicits this activity. Um, what did the students do with this? Um, Rob and Kuhn and some of the other students in this project decided to um, want to challenge people into um, a duet of touching each other and hence get to know each other better. So people on Lowlands don't know each other and this would be an opportunity to get to know each other by touching each other. Um, and what the students want is, wanted is that this touching would be a dynamic way of touching each other. So they wanted people to explore a dynamic way of touching each other. Um, then the, the question was how to uh, uh, elicit people to do this. And that was the moment where um, uh, the product came into play and they, start, they started to design a product. And this product is what we will tell about in this uh, presentation. Um, the students designed a flexible screen and this flexible screen that can measure the touch, the way people touch each other through their screen. And, um, then the touch that is measured is translated into a musical composition. So the idea is that then the musical composition reflects the touch and then motivates people to explore this touching each other. Um, after one semester, about half a year, uh, the project ended and they ended up with a concept and a first uh, model of it. And um, since this was a very interesting concept, we um, in the research uh, department, the depa so we are part of industrial design and we have a research part, educational part. In the research uh, part we were interested to further develop this uh, concept and also from the side of Lowlands they were interested to really see if this concept could be developed into an installation that could be implemented on Lowlands. Um, so over the last year we further developed this project, Rob and Kuhn did an internship and it was indeed implemented on the Lowlands Festival. Um, what, we t what we tell here uh, is more from the multimodal perspective of this project. So how to um, um, map touch with sound so that you really get the feeling of, um, having, of, of hearing the music of touching each other and to how this can stimulate this uh, uh, exploration in touch. Um, so Rob and Kuhn will tell a bit more about that, how we did this through a range of iterations. First, Kuhn will come forward then. Okay, hello. Uh, first, I will show you a little movie to explain our concept so it's easier for you to understand. Yes, it starts. Okay, uh, this uh, video shows the main concept of the Touch Me There project. Uh, it's a screen in the middle and people touch each other through the screen and then they will create music. And this music uh, should motivate people to touch uh, through the screen, because else nobody will do it.
So that is the concept. I hope you get it. <laughs> so in this movie, uh, 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 the screen was not uh, working yet. It was just uh, the sounds were implemented later on in the movie. But just to give you an idea. OK, so here you see the concept uh, again. We uh, are touching the screen, and the screen uh, has a certain sensory input. We, we have these touch variables uh, we can measure with the screen. The screen has, it has its sensor system that uh, creates this input and get, create the output of a musical composition. And this musical composition should uh, motivate the people to, um, to, to get into this movement. And uh, in this way, we search for uh, a unity in touch and uh, musical reflection. So it's a certain loop because also the music reflect of a, um, also the music influences who, how people move. And we, in this, we search for uh, this unity uh, with a clear uh, coupling between the touch and the sound. Therefore, we, this is our first iteration. Uh, we created this screen. Um, and this has uh, 18 sensors in, implemented it. So this is, uh, can be seen from the inside. This, these are all the, the sensors in the screen. Every sensor has its own uh, music sample attached to it. So for exam example, uh, one is the bass, one is the guitar. So, and together they create a whole song. Uh, at the moment uh, that a sample is touched, uh, a music sample will be played, and in this case it's unmuted. And um, we want people to make this music uh, through this uh, body contact, and we wanted to elicit more and more body contact. So, they could uh, play, if they increase their body contact, they will play more samples, so they will increase their, their output, but there's also with the intensity of the, the meeting with the other person. contact to uh, create different music so they can vary the music by varying their body contact. So uh, let's see how they do. As you can see in this movie not really much music is created because all these, there are just a few sensors in the screen and they have to search for it and then they also have to uh, push it together from two sides and we didn't explain how it works, so they're really uh, trying to figure out what does this product do, and sometimes they just accidentally uh, touch each other, and then if they were in the right place, they could hear a music sample, but often they did. So in, in this movie, you can see the focus was too much on the screen, and people trying to find out how this product worked, uh, instead of focusing on the other person, which was our goal, because we wanted to create this meeting, this. Uh, uh, intensity of touch and that should be motivated by music and not uh, creating music because that's what they were uh, trying now. Uh, therefore we uh, created this screen and Rob will tell something about that. Hi. So as you just saw in this first screen, the problem was really people 
didn't touch each other or when they touched each other, nothing happened. So what we decided was in this new screen to yeah, put, totally fill it with sensors. So we created 120 sensors on each side, 20 by 20 centimeters. So if people touch each other, we can always measure that and we can do something with that. We could program that in any way we wanted. So we, um, yeah, we coded that in two different ways of interaction. Uh, in the first way, so this is the sensor grid from the software. Um, if people touch each other from both of the screen from both sides at a certain place, a music sample would start playing. Then if they move together, the sample would change. So it would change to a different uh, sample in the same collection. So for example, a bass line, and then if they move, it changes to a bass line with a little bleep, bleep, bleep or something between it. If you let it go again, the music fades out. And if people make a new touch point, so for example here and here, you get two different music samples. I'll show a little simplified version of that to explain it. Yeah, just one touch, a music sample. In a second interaction that we coded, um, the touching was the same, so if you touch each other at a, at a certain place, a music sample would start, but this time it would be, uh, the position would determine its balance. So if you would move from left to right, the, the balance of that sample would also change. Also in this interaction, the size of a contact area would determine its, its volume. So if you just touch with hands, you have a very soft sample, if you use your roll, yeah, half of your body, it would be a very loud music sample. So that is. we ran a lot of big user tests to find the differences between the interactions and to find out how people interact with the screen. This is a movie of that. And what you see here, people do touch each other, they are creating music and you have quite some parallel movement, so that's a good part. This is also what we really, really wanted to, to increase the body contact, to get strangers to touch each other in a different way than you normally do, without a handshake or something. Well, so the the, the, the social focus was much better in this version because people were really focused on each other. They were touching together, st stroking, discovering the screen. However, in both the interactions, there was no difference in the dynamics of movement. So people did it move differently with different interactions. And it was, uh, we expected that people would behave different. Also, people did not, they knew that they were creating the music, but they had no idea how exactly or what they could do or should do in order to change it. So at the moment we're still reflecting on this for a next iteration. Perhaps it's the size of the sensors. They are now 20 by 20 centimeters. Uh, human movements are sometimes quite small and dense. So perhaps that's one of the problems. Another possible cause could be that the variations of the samples is 
yeah, not changeable enough. People do not know that a sample change is that they do it. Um, the, the, the relation between the touch and the music is also difficult if you move to the right and the balance changes. That's one way of translating it. But yeah, people just didn't seem to understand how they were creating music. So that's what we're still working and searching for. Um, yeah, the screen was also further developed for the Lowlands Festival. We had a couple of DJs who made different music collection sets to create different ambiances. And yeah, it has been on the Lowlands Festival for three days with a lot of people in a lot of different conditions, of course, on such a festival. What you saw here as well, people, well, most of the people were just touching each other and they discovered a good excuse to go and touch other people, but most of the time they didn't knew who was on the other side, so that gave quite some unusual meetings and that was one of the goals as well. Um, but again, we saw the same issues here. People did not know how to create the music exactly. Some of them even didn't notice that they were creating the music. They thought that the music just stopped if they walked, yeah, walked, walked away. So that shows that for some reason people do not understand yeah, how to create this music or so that yeah, we still have lots to do. And I should be uh, yeah, continue on that matter. Um, yeah. Um, what we did discover, we, we have been working now for uh, for two years on this, and, and I think Rob and Kuhn really did hard work last year, very much work, but at the same time we just now discover that we're just at the start of a project because this relating of, of touch and music um, is something that, inco that involves very many different aspects um, uh, to know about, to have experience uh, in, to have experienced people in music, in how people feel a touch and can, can change it, etc., etc. Um, so um, this is work in progress, and we're now looking for um, ways to continue it. Um, we're very much um, looking at how we could play, for example, with a resolution of the sensors, so what, what um, uh, Rob says. Um, but also looking at which music variables are dominant over the others, because right now we worked with samples, and of course, um, within the samples you have many variables that, that cannot be manipulated and it seems that they overrule um, the, the variables that can be manipulated. Maybe that's why people don't hear what they are doing and what is part of the samples. Um, so, and um, uh, we, we're also looking at, because it's a synesthesia issue, what is, this, what is the sound of touch? You can make many different um, programs of this to just find out which part works better than the other part and to get, an, get a feeling on that. Um, and another issue of course is, and you could see it in the Lowlands um, uh, film, is that the affordance of the screen itself is it's very much of a trampoline. We made it heavy and, and uh, huftig proof, so to say. Um, but of course it therefore is not about stroking and this, this sounds quite logical, of course, but that's something to study, how you can balance that. Um, so this is a uh, work in progress, and um, if you have questions, suggestions, we're welcome or ready to answer or <laughs> hear your suggestions. presentation. Uh, could it be transparent? The, the That's the first question that people ask. <laughs> um, we want to focus people on touching, so we excluded the, or we, the students excluded vision because um, they wanted people to really concentrate on um, the feeling of touch and to not have um, what, what you call visual prejudice. So really, you don't know who is behind that, but you find out by touching what his or her behavior is and how you react to each other. Um, so really focusing on that, that's why. Yeah. 
Could it touch the bone size to actually the sound or is it yeah. Yeah, so it's really, it's not that people have to touch the screen, but it's really touching each other through the screen. And that is measured if they are touching each other. Yeah. To, to follow up on the previous question, did you ever try it with, with a CPU on the screen? Um, right, right now it's not possible because the, no, the so sensors so. are <laughs> blocking it also. So we didn't, but we, what we did try is, um, and, and that relates a little bit to vi vision. Right now it's quite, thick screen and actually it's too thick uh, because of the, uh, the, the technology where we are working with uh, right now. Um, and uh, the initial, initial um, idea was a simple screen with no sensor in it, in it but yeah, you, you did it with uh, uh, your other student. Uh, just feeling each other with having the sheet so you can see the impression very much on both sides. So and that, that was very inviting because that is mysterious and you can feed each other and that's... So we would like to go there also, but that's something to... Oh, okay. to I think that there's uh, a couple of people in this space as well that uh, work with uh, wearable technology that actually could do what you're hoping for, yeah. the flexibility of the, yeah. of the screen. So mm -hmm. is anyone uh, that wants to react on that? Uh, maybe Stock or Seymour, if you're here? <laughs> I, was, I was thinking in terms of the sensors that you use in the Softin project. Would that be something to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you want to sense the actual pressure, how hard is being pushed, then you need something that can actually be pushed, something that has a thickness, and then you can measure the change of. Yeah. yeah, and that's the also... The thinner it becomes, the more the less sensitive the sensor will be. Yeah. And that's about how hard you push. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Yeah, you said you were a designer, but I don't see exactly see the design thing in it. Ah. <laughs> so, okay. where is it? In, in this, uh, yes. in this, uh, in this uh, installation, yeah. um, uh, that's a good question. Now it depends on how you how you look at design. In, in Eindhoven, we are doing industrial design, and we're trying to um, uh, create interactive products that are hi highly behavioral and have uh, interaction possibilities. Um, uh, that are much into the interaction, the form of interaction. Okay. Um, so this means that the, um, uh, the design of the product is very much focused on the form of interaction that people can have with it. So that, that means that, that the, the, um, uh, um, the way the product looks is not the prior focus in the, in the start. Well, it's not really a question, it's something that I feel. Um, I was asking myself, what is it they want to do with this product if I'll find something like this in front of me? And the, the answer of myself will be that I want, I want to go inside a room that is quiet, um, maybe a white room, and the screen will be there, and maybe someone will tell me that this is something is going to happen now, there's going to be another person, someone is going to explain me a little bit of what is going to happen. Maybe someone will close my eyes or put a blindfold on me. Yeah. And I'll go be quiet and no party around. Or, and I'll, I'll know to use, I'll feel to use my body to, to be more quiet, kind of more, let's, let's create something, vibe. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah, that, that, maybe that, that relates to the context where you put this screen and how you, exactly. that's what you mean, eh? Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah. The, um, um, uh, that's also what we thought about. Right now, it was in, on Lowlands. It was displayed in the in the Gols, uh, um room, which is very much of a place where people drink and have fun. Um, and um, um, originally, we didn't, or we I didn't design it, but the students designed it really to actually be outside. Um, and it it, and in the end, was put in the Gols stand because of. Uh, with it now. 
yeah, different, different pra practical conditions because of the development. But it actually should have been on a place where it's more quiet and people are more in a relaxed um, situation and then start to explore. I think it will be, now I'm thinking again about it, and I think it will be, it's difficult for a person to go into a wall to start trying to touch it, even though he knows there's some other person on the other side. I think if blindfolded, so you yeah, don't feel like point. blank, you on the wall, what yeah. do you do? Yeah. But if you're blindfolded, so you can start to use exactly what you, you want to use, which is the touch. Mm. Yeah. So that's, that's one. Yeah. yeah. So one more question. No, but that's a thought for a next step. We right now wanted to um, to have the musical output also to be heard to the audience that is around, really to have an event where people gather around. And, um, but having a headphone would be also in another context, maybe a little bit like this isolated room which uh, the other person was talking about. And that's, that's very interesting because that also brings you into a very concentrated own space, but that's, yeah, that would be another direction. And something yeah. with light, I think it would be very good as well. Like, what, what you said, like, when you isolate it, especially if you can put the light on it, and then you can, um, how more you touch, how more you see, and mm -hmm. how more yeah, yeah. That's also that. That was also one of the uh, because when because at first was the idea of making people touch each other and then having a means to do so and and the music was one of the things they chose and visual things could have been one also. But <laughs> there's many ways of doing it. Yeah. yeah. So okay, I think uh, we should move on to uh, Cecil's presentation. Okay. Thank you.
travel after three months. This is another play that in the south of France. I asked about individuality, about identity and smell. It's a huge play. I worked for two years. And what you see here is just some visuals that show us some volume cells, process the plug. I asked the inhabitants of the city of Montpellier to bring me their favorite garments they've been wearing for quite a period without washing. I bring the headspace analysis of the software and hardware used in the industry to do simulation of plants. And I might say that I'm the first that we're used to starting to use this in reality. I did car crash simulation from Mercedes. I worked in big streets and made simulation of city neighborhoods since 10 years and uh, some people's bodies and so on and so forth. This software and hardware is amazing and you can use it very easy as a tool and it helps you in a way to reproduce the smell of reality. So in this case I analyzed all the garments and bring them back to the inhabitants of Montpellier, showing them this is your identity to smell. Smell is not just one isolated molecule, it's a complex thing. So you go back this is a CV of a coat telling the content of the smell of that coat. The people were so perplexed and so disappointed about, about their own smell. Most of the coats and jackets, they never want to wear. And even some of the visitors went to the industry and complained. Like this guy, this woman, she went to Chanel and I was like, I've been using this smell forever and you promised me that it would change my life and nothing else would come through it because you got out of smell. And I can have a very funny story and recording this person. Here's another project at the end of the about money. <coughs> I've been spending money over six years in UBS Bank, with UBS Bank, supporting UBS Bank in the University of Zurich. I developed uh, the same, the same to 37 people, telling them to describe the scent, to smell, in their professional language. These people came from 37 different parts of the world, spoke 27 different languages. And what was for me here of, of interest was really to see if one is able to identify a smell without having necessary, uh, necessary visuals or content, context or content of what the smell is supposed to be. So they, they got the smell, perceived, and were asked to write a text in their professional language describing what the smell could be. Because by me, it's not only about the smell, it's easy to reproduce. I mean, it became easy because I've been doing so long. But the second aspect is really what happens when you let information go through your nose to the brain? How does it come out of the language you speak? Is it possible to communicate smell in the daily language instead of you know, using metaphors and metaphors? So I've been doing a lot of, lot of work in this field and slowly. We also made some dictionaries with some universities in the US. So this is one of the research projects in this direction. The, the uh, results, and what I showed here in Simone and Art in Berlin, is the, con is the contribution of all the people. They vary from, from industrial designers, scientists, to farmers, and industrial uh, you know, people working in the industry of different kinds. So it's not just uh, intellectuals that got confronted with the smell of money. And behind the door, you could smell the money that would, uh, would help the nanotechnology micro and cups. This is technology that has origin in the scratch and sniff used for the gloss magazine to, to, to demonstrate or to, to do PR for perfumes. We developed this technology much further. You just have to touch the surface and release the smell. What happened, how this technology is made is like the scent is end capsule with micro eggs. So by touching the surface, you break the egg. And the durability is like a credit card you touch it six to seven thousand times, and that's in the last last of the scent. And I from my, in my presentations, it's very smelly, you can smell all the time because I don't interested in combating with, with information, you overload it with smell all over the place. But you can by act 
think by the way that if the way that the activity the situation you can smell is more. But it is always the starting point of, of the of the of the tools and try to show. So and behind this walls you could touch the walls and you can the doors you can touch the wall. So here a person tried to, to feel rich and it was unbelievable. The fact is that the smell and immediately the touch your emotions and it goes to the subconsciousness. It's so efficient, it's unbelievable. People were scratching the wall, we cut the pieces out of the wall, kissing the wall, standing in front of the wall, licking the wall for months. It was unbelievable. <laughs> and all this smell becoming the the VIP for private bankers in the US had ordered to and Visa is making credit cards not only you develop the plastic which you, you can integrate and set in the plastic and it lasts forever. So, if we don't have it. But it's very efficient and I uh, I'll tell you later about how I use these kind of things also in reality. So these are the contributions, all the texts of all these 37 people were on display how they try to find to find technologies in the professional language to describe the smell they have found in the world. And through this project, those people involved with Sonic who decided that in Paris, they were still in the work of different projects together since then. So it opened a lot of doors for me and I read the people in the university, designers, industrial designers, some milk companies, milk packaging companies want to have real smell of milk on the paper. Whatever. This is a big project for lots of city projects I've been doing. For more so than I'm in smell of north, south, east, west Berlin. I started to do the cityscape smells in the middle of the 90s. I've done Mexico City, London, New York, Paris, Berlin, and I'm doing Tokyo and Shanghai for the moment. So it's a huge project about communication, smell, and language. I developed <coughs> four different smells from four different labels. So here's on display in Berlin, in Berlin, 2004. Here's some details. What you see on the maps are the areas I was doing a simulation. So at first I went in with my own nose. I can go in a situation and smell and identify immediately. Know exactly where the source of the, of the smell comes from. So I did about half a year in four different neighborhoods, which are extreme, uh, hardly have anything to do with each other. <coughs> then I went back to the headspace, which is the technology used in the industry. And I worked there over half a year to simulate the different set neighborhoods. I reproduced the set, went back to the in the neighborhoods and ask them this is the smell of your neighborhood. Can you please describe it in your trivial language? Some people did, I did all the recording. I worked on the text and the narration for three months as a linguist and created these technologies out of these narrations, which I then again used to communicate the smell of the neighborhood. So I tried to show this whole process. Parallel, I gave the main smell to 15 most of them. Renovated uh, TR agencies for smoke for perfume because we spent we communicate some perfume we we communicate scent for society the perfume that's in the market with over size the and we gave this scent just to check if this is a fact. So the smell is really harmful. It's polyester, it's starving coffee, it's kebab, it's exactly uh, it's uh, yeah whatever you can imagine. In a good mixture, but I have knowledge how to build up these things so you can really identify all the different ingredients very, very clear. So the agencies describe this as they do with all other sexy, selective, out of the shower. I'll show you an example. So here you can try this out the different realities. I call it the tree of one, two, and three. First, the trivial language is this to the right. Here you have technologies used for the PR, the PR world, describing the same smell. All of this red is about describing 
and my label holds and the whole people come and get the same smells and you know, they feel like these are the streets that I have here are the different technologies that I created for this specific product and this was on display in the fact in the house of the place downstairs was a dictionary and we were walking around the cinema to the conference and the gallery and all of our technologies that and all the way to the smell when we walked the smell was on display as well but how did we do that? This is here at nine which is what I was
how to describe experiences. So um, this is a project that I've been um, engaging with my colleague Adam Spears uh, from the University of Bristol, and he's kind of like the grand scientist of this project who built um, this device in his uh, bedroom, and this is it. So uh, I'm going to talk to you free to um, have a go and, and feel, it, feel it out. So. We call it the Inactive Torch, and it's a sensory substitution device. Um, so, just to give a brief outline of this talk, uh, in the beginning uh, I want to talk a little bit about the motivations of uh, why we built this device. Um, and then I will go into some of the design aspects and some of the experiments that we've been doing. And then I'll conclude with some um, suggestions of where we're going to take this next. So, uh, the, the broad context uh, of this device is um, that uh, recently in the Department of Sciences we have something um, of a paradigm shift going on, which um, essentially started with the publication of this book called The Embodied Mind. And uh, um, instead of boring you with all the details, um, I'm going to try to demonstrate the main message of this book with a little experiment. So, um, just Grab this, right, and um, tell me what is the texture like. So, what is the texture like? It's soft. And it's soft. Okay. Yeah. It's soft. It's soft. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's fine. Brilliant. So, if you had a look at his hand, um, what he was doing while he was trying to see the texture was moving his hand around, squishing it, right, so moving it around like that. And then that's basically the, the perfect example that uh, this approach to uh, cognitive science says we do for all perceptions, which is basically um, an embodied um, active exploration of the environment. So whereas before it was a passive receiving of information, that was the obvious perception. Now it's kind of the other way around. And uh, active embodied movement is now playing an important role. So another source of evidence for this approach um, comes from sensory substitution devices because it was found out that in order to actually be able to use one of them, like for example the, the Tom one that we saw earlier today, is that you actually have to be able to guide the device with your own hand. If someone holds the camera for you and, and moves around the room and gets a sensation of your tongue, let's say, um, you won't really be able to make out what's going on. There has to be a correlation between the action and the sensations that you get. So, um, actually, one of the earliest devices that uh, was doing this was developed in the uh, early 1960s by Bakke Rita and his colleagues, and it was called the Tactile Vision Substitution System, TVSS. And um, as you can see in the picture of the top right, basically you had a tactile array of stimulators on your stomach or on your back, which were hooked up to a, a camera. So this is one of the earlier devices until they, before they um, developed the thing with the tongue. And after um, some extensive training, people were able to navigate novel environments, and they were able to read simple text, um, and even distinguish um, different faces. Um, so that's, that's pretty good already, but what really caught the attention of uh, the cognitive scientists was that um, spontaneously, subjects would report that they would have a presence of space when they were using it, as if there was some sort of special um, spatial mode of perceptual awareness. So just to give you an example from uh, their paper, Dr. Um, Richard writes, our subjects spontaneously report the external localization of stimuli, and that sensory information seems to come from in front of the camera, rather than from the viral attackers on their back. Um, so that's the kind of descriptions that you get in literature. But it turns out that if there's very little agreement about what that experience is really like. Some people say that it's like touch, some people say it's like vision, because obviously you can use it to engage in um, things that require vision normally. And some people argue that because there's uh, this technology involved, um, it's actually a new perceptual modality. Um, so what's important about this debate is that traditionally, um, the way to go about answering the question, you know, what is it, the touch, the vision, is to look at the abilities of the subject, um, and as well as the verbal reports. That is, uh, both of my third-person um, data. 
So it's not that the experimenter is having to do with it, he's just looking at the subject uh, um, out there and uh, gathering some information. But um, it turns out that there's a problem because nobody can agree, based on those sources of information, what it's really like. So Noe, who wrote a, um, quite a popular book recently called Action and Perception, said that these experiences should be fully visual or visualized to some extent. Then uh, Bob says, well, there's doubt about that, maybe spatial perception by a tactile sensation. And then Prince says, well, maybe it's automatic appearance. So something more cognitively oriented. Um, so how would we go about you know, choosing between these different options? Um, and it seems like if we just base our um, data on, on the third person approach, then we can never go beyond educated guesses. And what's, it seems to us that it would be much better if the experimenters themselves would also have access to these devices and the philosophers engaged in this debate, so that they can experience it themselves and then you know, inform the debate um, using their first person experience. Okay. Um, it's not easy to describe experiences, uh, as we've seen in the previous talk, and it takes years to, to really become good at it. And um, the special problem with doing it in for sensory substitution is that, of course, the devices are not generally available to the research community. Um, they're not normally commercially available, they're quite expensive, they require a lot of training. Um, so we thought that you know, if we want to get this debate off the ground and, and really get to grips with what's going on when we use these devices, it would be better to start with a device that would be effortlessly replicated by the research community, um, it would be non-intrusive, um, it would be simple to learn so you can just pick it up and start experimenting with it, um, but you know, of course it still needs to generate interesting results. And uh, it's from this context then, that we developed the inactive torch. Now the device that the adapter is actually based on an older device called the haptic torch, which um, my colleague Adam Spears developed at the University of Reading for blind navigation. And um, the inactive torch basically developed out of that um, with a focus on how to study perception. So the original motivation for the haptic torch was that um, the, the the most used uh, we almost call it a substitution device by the blind is the cane, but it has certain shortcomings because um, essentially you have to make physical contact with an object in your environment in order to know it's there. Um, and since you don't want to hit people and cars, um, what you usually do is you keep it quite close to your body. But of course, if uh, an active corporate science is right, it says, well, you know, it's the active exploration of the environment, the embodied action, which really constitutes perception, then that's of course a bad thing. What we want is uh, for them to be able to explore the environment freely. Um, and uh, just, just to give a little bit of an introduction to what used to be done in order to um, solve uh, blind navigation, here's some uh, prototypes. And what the general gets done is we have a big uh, computer somewhere which represents the whole environment uh, um, in front of the person, um, and then somehow you know, converts it to audio, like a voice talking and saying um, what's around you and so on. But as you can see from the pictures, these are quite bulky, heavy, and complex, um, and just generally quite impractical. So what we want is something that you know, encourages exploratory movement. So this is a picture of the haptic torch. Well, a little anecdote actually about the name, uh, the torch. Uh, we just had a famous professor visiting uh, the University of Sussex, and we told him, here, this is the inactive torch. And he was like, are you carrying the Olympic torch for the inactive movement in cognitive science? And we were I was kind of confused until I realized that in the States, of course, the torch is actually you know, something with fire, whereas in England, the torch is a flashlight, what they would call it. So it's a little bit of confusion there, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, in any case, um, so it's a very simple device. It only has one sensor, which is an ultrasonic sensor. So it works kind of like bat echolocation, which uh, measures the distance to objects around you when you point at them. And it has uh, uh, one tactile output. And, uh, with that, you can measure um, the distance. Now, the traditionalists would say, well, with one, only one channel of information, you know, how could anybody make sense of the environment just using that? But it turns out that even in vision, even though we have this feel that we have a complete detailed uh, view of the world when we, we look outside, what really happens is that when we look around, our eyes saccade around and pick out certain bits of interest. 
And it's just that because wherever we look, actually, yes, that's where I focus and that's where we get the detail from. That's how we build up the picture. Um, uh, and, and it's not completely represented as a model in our mind. So we basically said, okay, the haptic torch can do the same. Wherever you point it, you know, it picks up the source of interest and hopefully you'll build up a, um, a, a presence of the world that way. So this is a, a little video of the, the haptic torch. Um, it has a little dial on the top which tells you how far things are. I mean, this video might look familiar to people who play computer games. Um, so you can see the, the dial on top moving around depending on, on, on on the distance. Um, then we had uh, uh, a friend of ours at uh, the University of Reading try it out. We said, okay, find the lamp post and we blindfolded him. And of course, you can imagine if he had a cane, how would he know which direction to go in? Right? Because unless you make physical contact, there's, there's no information there. But nevertheless, uh, with little training, um, he managed to find it quite quickly. <laughs> Um, and then we did uh, well, added some uh, experiments uh, with an actual blind subject as well. Again, with minimal training, just telling him, please uh, um, find the pole. And you can see that he's, he himself is surprised at how easy that was. Um, so the inactive torch builds on this device, but we incorporated a couple of things so that we can um, study the way it uh, constitutes perception a little bit better. So we have a, a, a link, for example, to the PC, so we can look at the, the, the data that's being generated. And we also added some other outputs, uh, and my favorite of that is that it can also vibrate in your, in your hand now, it's, it's not just the dial. So this is what the device looks like. Um, just at the bottom right, you have a little uh, diagram of uh, reading. When you we sweep the um, an active torch around, and you can see that um, there's something farther away, and then as you come to the middle, something is close, and then something further away uh, again. So the environment is basically this. We swooped around the chair, and there's a box in the middle, so you can see kind of uh, how the reading uh, correlates with the environment. Then we did a couple of experiments um, where we asked subjects who were blindfolded again after minimal training just to navigate the environment, um, pick up a little box of donuts that they were rewarding in. Uh, and then come back, and they were also able to do that quite successfully. So it looks like we've got something here, right? We're, we're back at uh, where Bafirita was. It's basically, we've got some kind of navigational ability up to very minimal training. It's non intrusive, right? You, know, you don't need to stick anything anywhere. Um, and, but we were also interested, of course, in does it generate the experience? And what is the experience like of, of using the device? And just from the very rudimentary investigations of, of uh, asking the subjects after that experiment, um, we got some promising results. For example, I need that six o'clock meant one meter, or um, it stopped feeling like vibration and more like space. So, in order to make sense of these uh, reports, um, I decided to um, uh, t test it out myself. So, basically, one weekend, I kind of locked myself away and just for a couple of hours each day just tried to, the, the, the inactive torch out uh, exploring my room. And what I found was that at first you, you pay quite a lot of attention to the stimulus to your hand. I was using this on the, um, the vibration simulation. Uh, and you kind of like, oh yeah, okay, now that's further away, okay, that's closer. Um, but quite quickly um, you pick up on the invariances. So for example, if I had a corner um, and I sweep around like this, then the intensity would be greater and then decrease again. So you get this kind of spike in intensity. And once you realize that that's what a corner feels like, you're quite adept at picking up elsewhere in your room. And you, you really had an aha moment where I turned around and was like, yeah, I recognize that. I opened my eyes, yeah, it was the, another corner sticking out from the wall. Um, what's interesting is that it doesn't, it doesn't end there, but actually, once you train a little bit more, when you sweep around an obstacle, it feels a little bit like something's impeding your wrist, right? As if you were kind of brushing against something. And of course, you know, your wrist moves freely. So there is some sort of um, uh, spatiality being uh, constituted there through the interaction with the device. So my, my feeling is that, yeah, let's try to push this minimal approach as far as we can. It's only got one channel, only got one output. But because of this, you know, being able to explore actively and circadian around the environment, if we get really expert level at using it, you know, perhaps couldn't we start feeling the texture of the world as if you were you know, brushing your hand around the environment? 
Okay, and finally, uh, I just want to point out some uh, of the things that we made, uh, might have in store. Um, is of course the original motivation was to build this device so that we can give it to all the philosophers and cognitive science and say, hey, you've been talking about this for ages, but you've never actually tried one. Well, have a go and and you know tell us what you think. Um, and then, of course, we can start also um, playing with the device itself. So the problem, of course, is when you investigate something like vision or another sense without technology uh, intervening, it, is that it's kind of hard to tweak your vision, right? I mean, you would have to do something inside the brain or something like that. But with this one, for example, what if happens if we change the linear um, translation between uh, distance and sensation to something different, right? Maybe make it steeper function, put a logarithmic function in there, how does that affect your experience of using the device? So we, maybe you can even map out a kind of space of uh, how that uh, relates. And then just to finally relate this to, to this event, um, we are also in, engaged uh, with a group of blind artists, performance artists who are called Extant, um, who are trying to get some funding for a blind theater where the audience, something like this here, would be immersed uh, in a particular environment using these devices to find a way around. Um, and what interest would be of scientific interest in that project would be to see whether the social interaction between the different users makes the experience different. Because what's happened with Bahirita's devices is that often the blind subjects don't actually really feel anything when they see it. So yes, they can recognize the face of their wife or a naked lady or something that they have always wanted to see, but somehow the emotional factor doesn't really manifest. So one suggestion is that it has nothing to do with the resolution of the information that they're getting, but more with the fact that they were isolated in it. They, didn't, they weren't able to share their experiences with other users, you know, compare and contrast uh, what it's like. Um, so perhaps by having several users with this easy-to-use device interacting, we'll actually see a qualitative change in experience to as when someone uh, learns how to use it alone. So this is an uh, ongoing work. This is just a, the first prototype. We got some funding to, to build some more. Um, so if you're interested to follow um, what's going on with this project, uh, that's our website, inactivetorch.wordpress.com. And uh, well, thank you for having me here. Thanks. Tom, uh, would it be possible to have like a, a live demo of it here? Like, uh, ask a volunteer sure, to, yeah. uh, to do something. Is there yeah. any volunteer? Any volunteer <laughs> over there? Yeah. Right. Are you right-handed or yeah? Okay. So if you take this in your right hand, this one. Yep. And this is in your left hand. Let's say, point at the, can you feel something already? Yes. Yeah. Okay, if you point at the, um, the wall here and then point into the empty space, yes. can you feel the difference? Okay, so um, basically just have a look, sweep around and, and get a feel for um, the difference in simulation. <laughs> There's no difference between uh, subjects and, and people. That's right. It's only the distance. Only so the distance. yeah, it's okay. because it's ultrasonic, so it just reflects the the um, ultrasonic wave coming back. So that that's definitely one of the difference between this and the Bashevita device. They were looking at color whereas this is only distance. So it's more like the cane in that respect. Are there, are there any, any small questions in the meanwhile? Nothing happens. Try moving it slightly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if it's too close, then, then uh, um, the, the, it, there's a certain range in which the sensor is adjusted. So if it's, it's really close, then... Doesn't There's one more okay. question here. Yeah, I was. Uh, it's, yeah. it's hardly a question, but more. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm really f fascinated by by your subject, and um, I don't know because you mentioned that you were uh, doing this also at the University of Reading, and I um, we were both uh, students at the Univers University of Reading when I Ad had, um, okay. developed the haptic torch, and then now he's at Bristol, and I'm at Sussex University. Ah, okay. 
because I I was uh, I attended a, a talk by Kevin Warwick once, yeah. and he is sort of doing this, but then integrating it directly into his nervous system. And and uh, yeah. I asked him also, what what does it feel like? And basically, right. it's the question like, what does it feel like to be a bat? You know, this this old philosopher. What did he say? Um, yeah, he made a nice PR. Uh, okay, answer, as always. <laughs> it's very difficult, okay? yeah. but it's very difficult. This this question that you are uh, asking. Uh, yeah, what does it feel like this subject? It, because it's really you are asking the subjective uh, right. Ex that, that's experience. yes, um, but it is the case that um, through training that you can get more accurate at describing the experiences. And of course, one of the big challenges is how do we go about that? Right? It, it takes some effort from the research community to learn a new skill, to really get together and and you know do their homework and go home and try it and write down something and then come back the next day and say. Well, your description differs from mine in this way. You know, can we work out why that is? Can we fine tune it, find some invariances? Um, but that's really the aim of this device. Because if you had something like um, Kevin Warwick's, where everybody would have to implant a chip in their arm, then of course uh, it would be hard to get some, such a project off the ground. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, let's let's take 20 minutes to to visit all these these projects here to uh, use the inactive torch, smell sizzles. Uh, smelly smells and of course use the uh, the emotional chair and try it out um, and in the meantime there's also still some uh, snacks here some food design in bags and uh, I'd like to state once more that there's some books there uh, by, by V2 publishing being shown uh, so please have uh, have some fun and in the meantime we'll get the uh, model 5 installation ready for its screen